you know what? Praying in the Spirit is what makes you strong spiritually. You get full of the Word, but then when you pray in the Spirit, that Spirit takes the Word and they both work together to make you strong. The more you pray in the Spirit, the stronger you are. The more you pray in the Spirit, the more you can walk in the Spirit. The more you pray in tongues, the more you pray in the Spirit, the better you're going to be able to discern situations around you and the more your affections are going to be toward the anointing instead of toward the world. Let's read this again here in uh, Philippians chapter 2. Is it from the Lord? Okay, come on up here. Turn your Bible to Philippians chapter 2. On your way there, something from the Lord. Go ahead. Well, we were in praise and worship. Um, I, got a, I got a vision from the Lord. It was... Uh, what I seen was a, um, a ship in a harbor, and as it was headed out to sea, it was attacked by another ship of pirates. But as I looked again, that ship turned into an ironclad ship from World War, World War I. Because, and the uh, Lord told me it transformed, because that ship, meaning us, um, took his word and put it into our hearts and meditated on it so that it could not be harmed by the pirates or the devil or other deceiving spirits. There's more. There's a little bit more. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. There's a preparation for that ship. There's a preparation. When a ship docks in a harbor, it's for preparation. It's for new supplies. It's to get a new coat of paint on the hull. It's to get a new crew that's fresh and ready to go. And this has been your harbor, says the Lord. This has been a harbor where you've pulled into to get new supplies, to get a fresh coat of paint, to get the anointing rubbed on you once again, says the Lord. This has been a stop along your journey right here in this convention for you to receive some things from me that you're going to need as you watch out again into the deep. Because God's going to bring in an increase to you. God's going to bring in to your hands supernatural increase of souls, supernatural increase of family. This is what I told you before, says the Lord, about your family and about your friends. They're coming in, but you've got to go out fishing. And so this has been a harbor where you've docked to get yourself ready, to mend your nets, to prepare yourself once again, to go back out there. And the enemies that are out there on the sea of life, they will not stop the flow of what I am doing. They will not stop the fish from coming in. They cannot stop it, says the Lord, because I have put my anointing on it, I've put my hand upon it, and you will go forth and put your hand to it, and you will bring in so many that you'll have to call for other ships to help you bring it in, because there'll be so many souls, so many people coming in, you'll have to call another friend, and another friend, and another friend, and another friend, and say, help, help. There's so many souls coming into the kingdom. Help me train them. Help me teach them. Help me bring them in. Because this is my time, says the Lord. The time of men is over. My time is here. And I am going to do my pleasure. I am going to do my will in the earth. For the, the devil has had it long enough. And religion has had it long enough. Now it is my turn. And the knowledge of my glory shall cover the earth. Like the waters cover the sea. And the fish shall come in, says the Lord. Hallelujah, give him glory. Praise the Lord. Amen. Good word. <laughs> glory to God. 
strong. strong. Some of you have neglected your prayer language. I'm not getting on your case. This is the Lord really trying to encourage you to make yourself strong. God wants you strong for these last days. How many of you want to know what's going to happen before it happens? Then you're going to have to pray in tongues. You're not going to know it otherwise. Praying in the Spirit makes you strong. It exercises your spirit. All right, Philippians chapter 2, starting in verse... Uh, well, let's, we read verse 1 through 4 last night. And we talked about having the same affection as the anointing. Having the same drive. I just couldn't get Smith Wigglesworth out of my mind today. The picture of him beating on that, that disease on that lady. The picture of him slamming dead people up against a wall, commanding them to walk in the name of Jesus. Some of you are going to do that. Some of you are going to do the same thing. You're going to go to school this year, and you're going you're to see somebody with a sickness or disease or bound up in a wheelchair or on crutches, and it's just going to burn on the inside of you. You're just going to get mad at the devil. You're going to get mad at disease. You're going to get angry. And as you fuel that fire by praying in the Spirit, you know when they prayed in the Spirit on the day of Pentecost, fire was shooting out of their heads. You know what that was? That was the glory of God. That's the same thing that happens at the throne of God. At the throne of God, there's lightning shafts coming out of His face. When you look at God's face, there's, there's bolts of light shooting out of Him. Beams, rays, just bolts of pure light like laser beams just coming out of Him. On the day of Pentecost, that's exactly what happened to those. It's a tongues of fire. It wasn't just little, a little thing like that. Like a, a bic, a little flick your bic thing. Fire was shooting out of their heads. Why? Because the same Spirit of God that was on Jesus filled every one of them. Whew. All right, now look at this. We're starting here again, Philippians 2 and verse 5. Let this, let, uh, let, 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 let. Let, let is not a hard word. Let this mind be in you, which was also in the anointed one and his anointing. Let. If someone wanted to give you $100, would you let them? Would that be difficult? All you have to do is receive, right? Well, look, this verse starts with the same word. Let. Let. How many of you let your mother feed you? I mean, you let her cook meals for you. I don't mean, meow. You, you let her cook for you. You let her. That's not hard to do. You're not doing the work. You're not putting out the effort. All you're doing is receiving. Let this mind be in you, which was also in the anointed one and his anointing. Close your eyes, lift up your hands, and allow the anointing to fill your mind, to fill your soul. Say this with me. Say, Lord, fill my soul with your anointing and with your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, go back to the Old Testament, to Second Chronicles, and... Chapter 7. Second Chronicles, chapter 7. I'll give you a minute to, to do that. Actually, go back to verse, or chapter 5 first. We're going to look at something there. Praise God. Second Chronicles, chapter 5, verse 1. So all the work that Solomon had done for the house of the Lord was finished. And Solomon brought in the things which his father David had dedicated, the silver and the gold and all the furnishings, and put them in the treasuries of the house of God. Now look at verse 11. And it came to pass when the priests came out of the most holy place, 
for all the priests who were present had sanctified themselves without keeping to their divisions. And the Levites, who were the singers, those of Asaph and Heman and Jejuthun, with their sons and their brethren, stood at the east end of the altar, clothed in white linen, having cymbals, stringed instruments, and harps, and with them 120 priests sounding with trumpets. Indeed, it came to pass when the trumpeters and singers were as one to make one sound to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord. And when they lifted up their voice with the trumpets and cymbals and instruments of music and praised the Lord saying, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. I want you to say that with me. For he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Say it one more time. For he is good, for his mercy endures forever. That the house the house of the Lord was filled with a cloud so that the priests could not continue ministering because of the cloud for the glory of the Lord filled the house of God. The priests couldn't stand up in it. Now look at chapter 7. Now all of chapter 6 is a prayer that Solomon prayed in the dedication of the temple. Chapter 7, verse 1. When Solomon had finished praying, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple, and the priests could not enter the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord had filled the Lord's house. And when all the children of Israel saw how the fire came down and the glory of the Lord on the temple, they bowed their faces to the ground on the pavement and worshiped and praised the Lord, saying, For he is good, for his mercy endures forever. I want you to say that with me again. For he is good, for his mercy endures forever. One more time. For he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Then the king and all the people offered sacrifices before the Lord. King Solomon offered a sacrifice of 22,000 bulls and 120,000 sheep. So the king and all the people dedicated the house of God. And the priests attended to their services, the Levites also with instruments of music of the Lord, which King David had made to praise the Lord, saying, for his mercy endures forever. Whenever David offered praise by their ministry, the priests sounded trumpets opposite them while all Israel stood, and they consecrated the house of the Lord. 22,000 bulls and 120,000 sheep. 22,000 bulls and 120,000 sheep. This was the sacrifice. This was the offering that they made to the Lord. Can you imagine how much blood that made? This was the biggest offering in history of blood. The Bible talks about the life is in the blood, and without blood there is no the, without the shedding of blood there is no remission of sins. And when the blood flowed from these thousands of bulls and thousands of sheep, sacrifices, this was property of people that they had brought to offer to the Lord. They brought it to the Lord, they dedicated the temple, they lifted up their voices one, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple like a cloud. I was listening to Brother Kenneth Hagin talk one time about what happened to him when he was a young boy and his body was racked with disease and he was in uh, their home. He was in this bedroom and he was getting a hold of a particular scripture passage in Mark chapter 11, verse 22 through 24, talking about faith talking about saying to the mountain, be removed, talking about believing that you receive it and you will have it. And he went to hell like three times. He was Baptist, went to a Baptist church. He had joined the church. He had gone to Sunday school, but he had never been born again. And if you're not born again, you're not going to heaven. 
And it's not because God is mean. It's because God provided one way for you to go to heaven. And that's through Jesus Christ. And if you don't receive him as your Lord and Savior, then you can't be born again. And if you're not born again, you can't go to heaven. He was a good kid, and he went to church, but he went to the gate of hell. But God said no. His mom was praying, the grandmother was praying, and he could feel something pulling him back from those gates of hell. These demons were trying to pull him in. But this, this force behind him pulled him back out of hell. And he was back in his body. He remembers, you know, leaving his body. He remembers seeing himself going down this long, dark tunnel into the ground. Three times. And the third time, he was healed. And he was in his room. And the grandmother came into the house. She had run to get help, run to get a doctor or something. She came into the house, and the room was filled with a cloud. It was the presence of God. The mother stood at the door trying to see in, but she couldn't see because it was too thick. The grandmother came into the house and wanted to go in to see what was happening. She saw that the room was, was all cloudy in there. She ran to the doorway, which the door, was, the door was open. She ran to the doorway to run into the room and ran smack dab into that glory and fell backwards into the kitchen. She couldn't get in. She tried it again. She couldn't get in. Finally, the mom said, we need to just wait. That's the presence of God in there. The glory of God like a cloud. When they got together and lifted up their voices one to praise and to worship God, God's glory filled the whole house like a cloud. And the priests couldn't stand up. Now, many people wonder about uh, this situation called getting slain in the spirit. And it's confusing to them. They don't understand it. Why do you fall down? And the reason is very simple. When the, the presence and the power and the glory of God is so strong, you can't stand up anymore. This happened all through the Bible. It happened here. The priests could not stand to minister because the glory of God was so thick that they fell down. This happened to to Saul on the road to Damascus before he became Paul, the presence of God showed up and it knocked Paul off of his donkey. And he's laying there on the ground, blinded, because the power of God was so strong. This happened in the Garden of Gethsemane before Jesus was crucified. He prayed and then he said, okay, it's time. And he took his disciples, and here comes Judas with the Pharisees and the scribes and the officers. They come up to him. Judas gives him a kiss. Jesus said, who are you seeking? They said, Jesus of Nazareth. He said, I am. When he said, I am, that's the same thing God told Moses at the burning bush in the wilderness before he went to deliver the Israelites. Moses said, well, who should I say sent me? God said, I am. I mean, there isn't a whole lot more you can say about God. He is. He is what? He is God. And over in Hebrews 11, it says, without faith, it's impossible to please him because he that comes to God must believe that he is, that he is what? That he is almighty God. Not that he exists but that he is who he said he was. There isn't anything he can't do. He's God. No one could ever change that. He's existed for eternity. He will exist for eternity. He is God. So Moses said, who do I say sent me? God said, I am. Jesus standing there in the garden, they say, we're seeking Jesus of Nazareth. He said the same thing God said. I am. And they all fell down. They came to take him away. And when he opens his mouth, they all fall down. 
Jesus said, no man takes my life, I give it. Power, glory. Now let me, let me show you this. Let me give you this picture here for a second, okay? The revelation that John had on the Isle of Patmos that where we get the book of Revelation from. The very beginning of that book, Paul on that, or uh, John on that island had a vision. It wasn't a vision, it was a visitation really. Jesus showed up. And he saw him, his hair was white like wool. Well, what has wool? A lamb. His hair was white like wool. His eyes were a flaming fire. From his waist down, it was like burning brass. In this temple that Solomon built for God, before you could come in to any area of the temple, right in front of the temple, there was an altar made out of brass where they would offer the lambs on, the sheep, whose hair were white like wool. And then there's a flaming brass altar where they would burn the offerings. When John saw Jesus, he saw the Lamb of God that was slain before the foundation of the world. That was what he saw. So Jesus, the Lamb of God, in the mind of God, He was the sacrifice that happened even before creation began because God had the plan already mapped out. So Jesus is hanging on that cross. They had whipped His back wide open. They had beat His face so bad you couldn't recognize Him. They had pulled the hair out of His face from His beard. They had put a crown of thorns on his head with like three inch long thorns and driven it into his skull with a spear. And he's hanging on that cross, nailed to it, his blood flowing all down. He was covered with blood. And then later on after he gave up his spirit, his spirit wouldn't leave till he gave it up. He gave up his spirit to the Father they came by to see if they were all dead before the end of the day. Normally what would happen is if they weren't dead, see the death of the cross is a death of suffocation. It's not a death of bleeding to death necessarily, but when you're hanging there by your arms, you can't breathe. That's why they nailed his feet too, so he could push himself up and die a slow, agonizing death. It was a torture device. It wasn't just execution. It was a torture device. Now the reason the Romans implemented the death of the cross, they did it for sport. These guys were warped. They did this for sport because they crucified all kinds of different people who had all kinds of different weird, strange, heathen backgrounds. And when they would crucify them on this slow, agonizing death, this torture device, they would call out on their gods and lots of weird, interesting things would happen. That's why when they were standing there, they said, well, why don't you call on your God? Let's see what he can do. Because the mentality of the day was they came to watch. It was a sport. When they came by, if the people who were being crucified were not dead, they would break their legs, taking away any kind of chance for them to push themselves up and get any more breath, and they would dangle there and suffocate to death. When they came by and found Jesus already dead, they took a spear. Now these Roman spears probably had heads on them that were about that broad, like, you know, 8 to 12 inches broad. And they put the spear up into his side, right up under his rib cage, and pulled it out, and water and blood flowed out. Now, there's only one way that water and blood can flow out in a situation like that. And that is if the heart 
exploded in his chest, thus filling up the chest cavity with fluid from the body. So literally, Jesus died from a broken heart for you, for me. But here's what I wanted to get to. When that sacrifice was made, when that blood flowed, see, there was no sin in his blood, none. He had never sinned, not once. No sin, the supreme, ultimate sacrifice. When that blood flowed out, it was released. The anointing that was on him was released because that blood was shed. Just like the anointing of God was released on these people in the midst of this sacrifice. The glory of God was loosed on them. Well, when Jesus gave up the ghost, the veil in the temple that was, I mean, this was thick. There is no way you could have just taken it and torn it but the veil in the temple that separated the presence of God from mankind was torn in half from the top. From the top. Not from the bottom where the people hung out. It was torn in half from the top to the bottom. From where God was to where man was. And opened up the way for you and me to come into the presence of God. To walk into the midst of His glory. Freely, boldly, without any condemnation. See now, that's, that's what righteousness is. You know, Jesus became sin. He didn't have any sin, but He became sin for us so that we could be made the righteousness of God in Christ. In other words, there is nothing wrong between you and God. God is not mad at you. He's not mad at you. The door is wide open. Now here's what happened when that blood flowed. Can you imagine what happened to the people who were around him and got his blood on them? That was the life of God. And it got on them. When Jesus died, anointing was released into the earth. When Stephen died, the first martyr died. You know, he preached to the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They took him out and stoned him to death, and he forgave them. When he died, the anointing that was on him was released into the earth, and more people got saved. And every time a martyr died, anointing was increased. And every time someone came in and someone locked in and someone joined up, the anointing increased. It grew. It got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. There is more anointing in the earth in operation than ever before. When God poured out His Spirit on all flesh on the day of Pentecost, that anointing was released into the earth and made available to everybody, but not everybody took advantage of it. The whole world went through the dark ages where no, almost nobody got a hold of the anointing of God. They didn't have Bibles. They, they didn't know what to do. And then a little bit at a time, light came into the earth. Light, light, revelation, light, revelation, light. Anointing increased, anointing increased. More martyrs, more people standing up for what the Word said, standing up for the revelation, losing their life, and anointing being released into the earth. More people got saved. More people came into the kingdom. More people got the anointing on them. More people inf affected other people. You know, I talked last night about Smith Wigglesworth, and we talk about John G. Lake. We talk about other men of God. I'll tell you what, I've, I've been reading in E.W. Kenyon's book, Two Kinds of Faith. If you want to build your faith, get something from E.W. Kenyon and read it. The man lived, he was born like in the, almost the mid-1800s, and he passed away just before eight, 1950, and he wrote some things that were way before his time. He wrote some things that, I mean, we're just now getting a hold of now. But he had a revelation of it. Anointing being released. Anointing, anointing, anointing being released. The glory of God 
ready to be poured out on the earth like never before. There have been prophecies after prophecies after prophecies about God pouring out His Spirit on all flesh in these last days. The last days are here. The last days are here. The last days are here. They're here. You're in it. It's right now. It's you. You're the generation. You're the ones. You're the people. You're the chosen generation. You are the chosen generation. You are. You are. You're a chosen generation. You are. That's not just talk, that's reality. We're that close to eternity. That close. That close. Eternity. Eternity. All the prophecies are being fulfilled. This gospel is going all over the earth. Jesus said this gospel will be preached in all the nations and then the end shall come. This gospel is being preached in all nations. Just a little bit left. Just a little. Just a little. Oh, and I love that prophecy that came forth earlier about your family and your friends coming in, coming in. It's going to be easy. It's going to be easy. Eternity. 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 We're touching it. We're touching it. We're touching it. Eternity. That's how you're going to be able to step off the curb and be instantaneously translated to a foreign country. Why? Because you're stepping into eternity. You step into eternity, there's no time or distance. It's all right there. It's all the same. Heaven, heaven lives like that all the time. Heaven's like that all the time. We're that close to eternity. No time, no space. Living at the speed of light. You step into it. That's what Enoch did. Enoch in the Old Testament, his faith pleased God, and he was not, for God took him. What was it? He had the same affections as the anointing. His affections were toward God. That's all he had affection for, is God. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 says, Set your affections on things above, not on things of the earth, for you are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. You set your affections on it. That's all I want. That's all I want. That's here lately. That's all I want. All I want is God. All I want is more Him. All I want. All I want. I, I want to see His face. I, I, I want to. I want to feel His presence. I mean, His presence is with me. He'll never leave me or forsake me. His presence is on me, and His anointing is on me. But all I want to do is be with Him. That's all I want to do. I mean, I love you guys, and I just, I have a blast preaching and ministering to you, but all I want to do is I want to be with God. That's all I want to do. And you know what? I'm not just talking about, you know, on my knees and on my face in prayer. I'm talking about living in Him. I'm talking about when I'm around my family, just being in Him. I'm talking about when I'm around my friends, just being in Him. That's all I want to do lately. It's just be in God. Just to love Him and to feel Him loving me. We need the revelation of God's love so bad. Let's look at the revelation of God's love. Ephesians chapter 3. I'm just cruising here. I'm just being led by the Holy Ghost. I don't know what's going to happen next. I have no idea. Look at this. In Ephesians chapter 3. Verse 14, Ephesians 3, 14. He says this, For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that He would grant you, according to the riches of His glory, to be strengthened with might through His Spirit in the inner man, that Christ, the anointed one in his anointing, may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, 
may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height to know the love of the anointed one and his anointing which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly ab above all you ask or think according to the power that works in us to him be glory in the church by the anointed one and his anointing to all generations forever and ever. Oh, man. Rooted and grounded in his love. Rooted and grounded in his love. Your roots sinking deep into the revelation of how much he loves you. And to know the love of the anointed one and his anointing that passes knowledge. The width, the breadth, the length, the height, the depth. It's huge. God would move heaven and earth for you. We sell ourselves so short. God's got eternity available for us. And we just take a little bit. I'll just take so much for me. Man, he wants to make you a millionaire. Why? Can you imagine sending your whole youth group to Russia to preach the gospel and you pay for it? Man. He wants to, you know, I have kids, okay? I have two sons. And at Christmas, my wife has to stop me. She has to stop me. I would go out and spend thousands of dollars on my kids. Because I love them so much. There isn't anything I won't give them. I want to give them everything. You know? In the midst of all that, we try to teach them how to spend their money responsibly, how to save, how to use their money wisely, and all of that, because that's important to know. But man, when it comes to Christmas time and birthday time, I want to get them this and this and this. You'd think it was my birthday. What do you want for your birthday? Ah, I don't, I don't, give me socks. I don't care. But when it comes to their birthdays, man, I want to get them the big stuff. Why? Because I love them so much. And you know what? I'm not trying to prove my love to them. I'm not trying to, you know, convince them that I love them. I just want to do it. Do you know where I got that from? God. He put that in me. You know where, you know, you know why he put that in me? That's how he is. With his children. Who's a child of God? Oh, oh. You know what? He wants to give you the big stuff. Now, you know what? When they were, when they were three and four, I didn't give them a car. I'd say, here, drive this. Why? They'd have hurt somebody and probably themselves. In fact, uh, we started getting into motorcycles. You can't hardly be around Kenneth Copeland Ministries and not get into motorcycles, you know? So I went out and I thought, well, you know, this will be cool. I'll get Jesse a motorcycle. So I went out and bought him a motorcycle. It was a Kawasaki 200. And uh, big green mean thing. And uh, the clutch was just a little bit ornery, you know? Like you weren't sure what it was going to do. Went out and I thought, well, we'll get Ryan something. We'll get Ryan something safer than a big old motorcycle. We'll get him a three-wheeler. So we got him a three-wheeler, a Kawasaki 250 three-wheeler. Now, if you know anything about Kawasaki's, they gear them in such a way that you could go to heaven in a hurry on them. You know? They're geared, they're geared for eternity. Okay? And I don't think I ever went more than third gear on the 250 three-wheeler because my hair was falling out. <laughs> 
And the, the 200 was the same way. I mean, Ryan, I mean, this 250, you know, really what I found out later, I thought this was interesting. What I found out later was that that particular model of three-wheeler, that Kawasaki 250 three-wheeler, was the reason that they outlawed three-wheelers. It was. That one machine was the reason they went to four-wheelers. Because so many people were getting hurt on that thing. Because the thing goes 90-something miles an hour. And, and meets trees, you know? Hello. So Jesse got on his 200 at the motorcycle rally one year. And he cranked it up. And he's starting to let out the clutch. And it's in first gear. That thing jumped into first gear. And he's going, it went, wow. He popped the wheelie, bounced off a truck, rode halfway up a hill, and wiped out. I thought to myself, this is not good. Had to pay for the repairs on the pickup truck which was not ours, and uh, we sold those bikes. You know, we, we blessed someone else with them, you know? Just, you be blessed, okay. Got some other bikes, some other motorcycles that were more suited to their, their size and their ability to be able to control them because they're machines. I mean, you gotta know how to control those things. Not just some little toy. But you know what? There isn't anything God won't give you. And when you are faithful and you show yourself responsible in the things of the Spirit and the things of the kingdom and the things of eternity, there's nothing He won't give you and there's nothing He won't do for you. Who knows, but you might just step off into eternity, visit them for a while, and come on back. Who said you have to be some old dude to have, you know, experiences with God? You don't have to have all the experience in the world to walk with God that way. All you've got to do is have a heart for God like David did. Man, God showed up on the scene with David. David killed lions. David killed bears. What have you killed lately? A mouse? <laughs> Kill a mouse, <laughs> The Lord was with me with the cockroach, and the Lord was with me with the cricket, and the Lord will be with me with you, you stinky mouse. Ah! Cut off his head, bring it back to the king. Oh, last time, check this out. This was so cool. Last time, Ryan, don't get embarrassed, okay? Last time, we were at the lake house. We go to my wife's uh, parents lake house and Jesse and Ryan they bring their BB guns that I gave them <laughs> and uh, we there's squirrels out there that mess up everything they go digging and everything and so we got there and we start shooting squirrels well, Ryan we got Ryan for his birthday this uh, co2 cartridge uh, pistol that holds a whole bunch of BBs so you can rapid fire I mean the thing is auto load and the whole deal so Here's this squirrel climbing up this tree, and Ryan goes out there and then they go, oh! and so uh, we took him and we took care of it and we uh, uh, brought him home. Cindy made squirrel and dumplings. It's pretty good. Tastes like chicken, but uh, we we you know when we skinned him when we took the little dude apart. There's his head, and Ryan goes, can I take it home? I said, why? He goes, I want to mount it on a piece of wood and put it on my wall. I said, Ryan, nobody mounts squirrel heads. He goes, yeah, but it's the first thing I ever got, and I want to bring him home. You know, just little funky-looking squirrel head. I want to mount him on a piece of wood and put him on my... I said, you're not doing it, man. I mean, this thing had, you know, little flea tick things in it and all this. 
this hairy little head. He says, well, I want to bring it home. So he wrapped it up in a bag and brought the little head home. We threw it away. We didn't. But he wanted to mount that little squirrel head. God was with me with the cockroach, with me with the mouse. God was with me with the squirrel. What's funny is you walk up, the thing's laying there, and you touch him, and he goes, and then it scares you. Everyone jumps back, ah! I mean, what's he going to do, you know? <laughs> Gnaw on your leg? Ooh. David, stand up. David was different. David was unusual. David spent time alone in the presence of God so that when bears and lions showed up, he attacked them. That's, that's weird. It's kind of like you and me. When the devil shows up, we just attack him. The devil comes and lies to you. You just attack him. Comes and tells you you're no good, you're worthless. Just attack him. The devil comes up, tries to put sickness and disease on your body. Just attack him. Just jump up and say, I want to remind you that 2,000 years ago at the cross, Jesus Christ gave his life, came down to hell, and defeated you. He took you. He took your authority away from you. He took the keys of hell and death, and he brought them back, and he gave me the authority. Take that. No weapon formed against me can prosper. You just beat him up with the word. Just beat him up with it. That's, that's how David won. He went out there against Goliath, some 10-foot-tall, slobbering dude with 42-pound lips. Blah, blah, blah. David goes out there against him. He says, what, are you, I'm a dog that you send a, a boy after me with a stick? David said, yeah, that's exactly right. Goliath said, I'm going to take you and kill you, and I'm going to feed you to the birds. David said, well, i got a few words, too. I'm going to take you. I'm going to knock you down. I'm going to cut your head off. I'm going to feed you to the birds. And all the earth will know that there is a God in Israel. <laughs> See, it wasn't, it wasn't the sling and the rock that killed Goliath. It was the word. David said what he was going to do before he ever did it, and I am totally convinced that it wasn't his ability that did it. It was He turned the word loose on the situation. He could have thrown that rock in any direction he wanted. He could have thrown it the other way, and it still would have hit Goliath in the head. Why? It wasn't the rock. It wasn't David's ability. It was the word that killed him. I'm going to kill you. That thing was on course, man. That thing had a destination. It had Goliath's forehead's name on it. It says it sunk into his forehead. <laughs> he fell down. David ran up. David didn't have a sword, so he picked up Goliath's sword, which was huge. I mean, the biggest Ginsu you've ever seen. And he hacked his head off and carried his head back to camp. Can you imagine how big that head was? Like this big, big old slobbery bleeding, ugly, gross head. David just picked him up by his hair and carried it back to, hey, king, guess who? Ah! How did he get that way? He spent time worshiping, praising, magnifying the Lord out there with those sheep. He knew about sheep. He knew about lambs. He knew about sacrifices. He knew about that stuff. He was a shepherd. God wants us to know the love of Christ, how big it is. The love of the anointed one and his anointing. The love of the anointing. Last night we talked about having the same affection as the anointing. How about having the same love as the anointing? I want you to close your eyes for a second. I want you to say this. He loves me. Say it again. He loves me. Say it again. He loves me. Say this. More than anything in the world, God loves me, cares about me. He needs me. He wants me. He accepts me. He desires me. He loves me. 
Now just lift up your hands and tell him you love him. I love you, Lord. I need you, Lord. I desire you, Lord. I want you, Lord. I need you, God. Oh, I need you. I need your presence. I need your glory. I need your love. I need your, your mercy. I need, Father, your grace. I need everything you are. I need everything you have. I need everything that's inside of you. I need it, God. I need you. I need you. I need you. I need you, God. I need you, God. I need you, God. I can't live without you. I can't live without you. I can't live without you. You are my life. You're everything in me. Oh, God. Where's that young man named James who got set free the other night? Where are you? Come here. One of the young men shared with me that sometime this week you wanted to, to just share your heart and just what had happened to you. This, this young guy is a picture of the love of God because he got set free. Just, just tell him what happened. Yeah. All right. It's loud. Okay. Um, for a couple of years ago, like... Um, I was Christian, but I didn't really get anything out of it because I had a lot of bad influences in my life, like uh, some pagan friends that I had, and I was messing around with this thing. It's a book called The Necronomicon. And we were messing around with some spells in there, and I did some spell, and uh, I got possessed. But I thought I had driven him out using some pagan spell, and I hadn't. And from, like, that was two years ago. And from then on, I had been practicing shamanism. But I came here, and Tuesday night, I decided that shamanism wasn't really all that I thought it was, and that this was a real thing. So I came up here, and I accepted Jesus into my heart, and all the nasties went away. Amen. Hallelujah. You know what? You know what? I believe that the reason that the Lord wanted him to share just now is because there's a number of young people here in this room right now that you think you've gone too far. And you think you've gone beyond what God can handle and take care of. And you think you've gone so far out there that his love cannot get a hold of you. You're wrong. You are so wrong. His love goes all the way to hell for you. His love goes all the way to heaven for you. His love goes to the ends of the universe for you. For you. And what the devil has done, what the devil has done is he's taken your problems and he's magnified them to the point to where those things seem bigger than anything that you've ever thought concerning God. But it's a lie. It's smoke. It's nothing. It, it, it consists, that lie consists of nothing compared to the substance of the love of God. If that's you, if you think you've gone too far, if you think you've done something that God can't or won't forgive, and the guilt just seems to grow day by day by day. You can get free tonight, right now. I want everyone to stand to your feet. If that's you that I'm talking about, if you need to get set free, you think you've gone too far, you want to get free from all this guilt, all these lies of the devil, you come down to the front right now. Come on, come on. Give them a big hand as they come. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on, come on. Come down to the front. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Trophies. 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 
There is nothing God can't do. There's nothing He won't do for you. Oh, He loves you so much.